Hello. All right, I'm back with section 1.3. And we talked about the I last time. Let's get into the ear, talking about the ear, another sensory organ. The ear, a very popular sensory organ, I have to say. It's responsible for hearing and also balance. The structure of the ear can be um, split into three categories. The very outer ear, the stuff you can see, the middle ear, stuff you can't see, and then the inner ear, which is the deepest ear. Ear parts, the cochlea, semicircular canal, vestibule, and the cranial nerve. So let's get into that. Here's the outer ear. It's responsible for protecting the ear and channeling the sound into your deeper ear. It contains uh, modified sweat glands that secrete ear wax. And it also has tiny hairs to help filter the air that enters the ear. So all that ear wax is secreted out of glands. Pretty interesting. If you break that down into its parts, there's the oracle or pina. That's the ear lobe. It's cartilage. And if you, if you feel it, you pinch it, it's hard, but it's also like movable. You can kind of, it's not like bone. We have the pina, then we have the ear canal the external auditory canal. It's a tube that transports the sounds towards your middle ear. Ear canal, external auditory canal, same thing. The middle ear is the very center portion of the ear. So right here, the tympanic membrane also known as the eardrum, it sends sound waves to the ossicles by vibrating. So as sound waves enter here, it vibrates and sends it further down the ear. The ossicles are three tiny bones attached to the eardrum or the tympanic membrane, uh, like a chain. Together with the eardrum, the ossicles convert sound waves into mechanical vibrations. So sound waves are waves vibrating in the air. And then as it hits the eardrums and the ossicles, they change sound waves into actual waves. So actual vibrations. So it takes it from air into something physical. And the three ossicles are named malleus, hammer, incus, or anvil, stapes, or stapes, stirrups. But here's the uh, diagram. If you wanna look at where each one is in the chain, the Eustachian tube equalizes air pressure and it drains fluid from the middle ear into the throat. So that's how it kind of equalizes the pressure in your ear. And that very deepest part of your ear, the inner ear, is also known as the labyrinth and it's responsible for balance, and hearing. Now within that inner ear, the cochlea, the cochlea, cochlea, it's the spiral in your ear. It looks like a snail. It spirals around the corti, 
And the cortex is the hearing organ of the ear, which is lined with hair cells that detect sounds and sends electrical impulses to the brain through the cochlear nerve. The semicircular canals of the inner ear are filled with uh, fluid. These canals are responsible primarily for balance. Let's see if I can zoom in here. Yeah. So these canals are filled with fluid and that in turn helps with balance. The vestibule, the vestibule, vestibule, uh, connects the cochlea, cochlea, and the semicircular canals. It is also responsible for balance and equilibrium. It sends electrical impulses to the brain through the vestibular nerve. The cranial nerve eight is formed by the cochlear nerve and the vestibular nerve. So these two nerves combine into the cranial nerve. See them eating. So we have the outer ear protecting the ear, directing sounds into the ear. We have the middle ear with the eardrum or the tympanic membrane, the ossicles and the eustachian tube. They change sound waves into vibrations. And then those vibrations are sent deeper into the inner ear for the cochlea, the canals and the vestibule. Um, and these turn those vibrations uh, into ways to interpret hearing, um, balance, and then they send that information to the cranial nerve, which is sent to the brain. And then your brain interprets what to do with that information. So all that mimics the eye where the eye translates uh, light into electrical impulses and the ear translates sounds into electrical impulses and then sends it to your brain. So cool. Now, things can develop, issues can happen with the ear as well. And we'll look at that today. Ear is a sensory organ responsible for hearing and balance. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and these are three issues that we are going to talk about today. Acute otitis media, tinnitus, or Meniere's disease. Acute otitis media is commonly known as an ear infection. This can be either bacterial or viral and this occurs in the middle of the ear. It's very common in children, oftentimes infants. Um, if they're not old enough to say my ear hurts, they'll, they'll cry. And sometimes this is the issue that is making them cry. And here are a few symptoms. Ear pain, which increases when lying down. So if you lie a kid down and they seem to be in pain or seem to cry very often, that can be an issue, an ear issue. If they are constantly like touching their ear or trying to pull it, that may mean that it's hurting them and they're trying to do something about it. If they can't sleep, if you've ever had an earache, um, you know, it can be pretty annoying and not a very relaxing thing to experience before bed. And if they're irritable, if they're crying, if they have a fever, 
And even if they aren't hungry or if they lose their appetite, it could be an ear issue. Acute otitis media, risk factors, um, being between six months old and two years old um, is a risk factor because of the size of your ear. Everything's so small that um, it, it can affect how often your ear gets infected. The eustachian tubes are part of the middle ear that equalizes air pressure and drains fluid from the middle ear into the throat. Um, and the size of that affects everything, especially in smaller children. Children who go to daycare are more likely to get colds and ear infections than children who stay at home. So if you're around other children, that's a risk factor and just being younger in general. Babies who drink from a bottle, especially if they're laying down while they're drinking, um, are more susceptible, are more likely to have ear infections than babies who are just breastfed. And lastly, if they're exposed to tobacco smoke, um, that increases the risk as well. How can you treat it? Oftentimes it just clears up on its own. Um, so it's mostly recommended that you wait and just see what happens with the pain and the fever for two days. If the fever keeps going, and if the baby still has a fever on like the third day and their pain is moderate or severe, the doctor may recommend an antibiotic. If children are having reoccurring ear infections, and that means within six months they had like three ear infections, um, they may require some type of procedure called a meringotomy, a meringotomy, a meringotomy, <laughs> sorry, I just had a moment, meringotomy. It, that's when a surgeon uh, makes a little hole in the eardrum and the doctor can then drain the fluid from the middle ear. And then they have this tiny tube um, that they place in the hole and it helps prevent fluids from accumulating. And these tubes um, stay in place for like six months to a year and then will fall out on their own sometime between then. But um, meringotomy. Meringotomy. Yeah, fun word. Not a fun word to say, though. Prevention. The guidelines to prevent ear infections, um, the same practices that prevent colds and other illnesses, like washing your hands, not sharing utensils, uh, avoiding smoke, breastfeeding your baby is always preferred if you can. Um, not everyone can breastfeed. But if you do bottle feed, hold the baby upright. So don't let the baby um, lie down and eat because that can lead to infection. All right, so that was ear infections. The next issue is tinnitus. And that is a ringing, buzzing, hissing, all that annoying sound that can happen with your ear. It's not a disease or an illness. It's just a symptom of an underlying problem. And that can be age-related. So over time, you will lose hearing. Um, if you injure your ear, that can affect your hearing ability. And then if there's some type of circulatory disorder, like if blood's not getting to your 
your ears, that can affect it. Risk factors. So if you work in a very loud environment, such as like construction, um, in some parts of the military, if you work in a factory, um, even musicians, if you're around um, amplifiers and playing music close to your ears, um, I suggest you use some type of ear protection. Uh, as you get older, the nerve fibers do not function as well, which can cause hearing problems associated with tinnitus. Men are more likely to experience this for some reason. Smokers have a higher risk of tinnitus. And then things affecting your blood flow can affect tinnitus. treatment. So first the doctor will try to determine what is causing the tinnitus um, and see if they can treat that problem instead. Some things that may help um, include removal of earwax or treating some type of blood vessel condition. Tinnitus may not be curable um, and if it's not curable, they use electronic devices to suppress the noise. So for example, um, white noise machines, if you've ever like listened to one of those apps where it tries to like make you fall asleep by listening to certain sound waves, um, white noise machines, they act like falling rain or ocean waves. Um, fans, if you turn on a fan at night, humidifiers, air conditioners, um, just so something in the background is making noise so you can't notice um, a certain ringing that is like barely audible to your ear. Hearing aids can help too. Um, masking devices. So a device can produce this low level white noise in your ear. So it'll distract your um, brain from your tinnitus, tinnitus retraining. So a person can wear a device and, <clears throat> excuse me, the device is programmed with music to mask the specific frequencies of tinnitus the individual is experiencing. And then that trains the brain to not focus on the tinnitus. So that is a way to um, help your brain not focus on the irritating ringing in your ears. <clears throat> How do you prevent it? So preventing tinnitus can include wearing hearing protection if you're shooting guns, um, if you're operating machinery that's very loud in a construction site or in a factory, um, or if you go to concerts, if you go to a lot of concerts like me, um, I would look online or go to the store to find some type of hearing aid, or not hearing aid, but earplugs. Now they have those like normal earplugs that you can wear for um, operating like heavy machinery, right? And those are just like the foam ones that you stick in or they have those over the ears that are even better protection. But um, at concerts, they, they do have um, these earplugs that are They don't let loud decibels get through to your ear, but you can still hear the music. So that's cool. It, it more like it filters the sound that enters your ear rather than block it out. So that's what I suggest if you like music and going to concerts. Um, I would look into that ear filtering earbuds. That can help.
Meniere's disease, Meniere's disease. This is a disorder of the very deep inner ear. Um, characteristics include vertigo. If you get a sense that you're spinning, even though you're standing completely still, that's vertigo. If you have hearing loss that comes and goes, um, tinnitus itself can be an issue. And then if you feel a lot of pressure in your eye, like behind your eye, that may be a symptom too. Risk factors, actually researchers are still trying to determine um, what's going on with Meniere's disease, what's causing it. It appears to be related to abnormal levels of the fluid within the inner ear and that can throw off your balance in the way you hear sound. So they're still looking into it. Treatment, um, it's not curable, but there are treatments um, to help manage the symptoms. Motion sickness medication, that can help reduce the vertigo or the sense of spinning. Diuretic, this is a medication that reduces fluid retention. So it makes your body hold on to less fluid and that can help regulate the fluid in your inner ear. The Mignette device, um, this generates pulses of pressure to the ear canal and that uh, helps the fluid move throughout your ear. Medication like antibiotics or steroids may be injected into the middle ear and then absorbed into that deeper inner ear. Prevention, um, since they don't know what causes it, they don't really have a good way to describe how to prevent it. If you don't know what's causing it, you can't really prevent. Um, which is unfortunate. But thankfully, it's less rare than ear infections and um, tinnitus. But that's all I have for you today with ear infections and uh, tinnitus and just learning about the ear in general. I hope that was helpful and I will see you guys later. Bye-bye. <laughs>